This is the new Forerunner 165, Garmin's newest budget-friendly smartwatch. The Forerunner series traditionally focuses on runners, and the new features here certainly validate that, yet it's really for anyone athletic. I've been testing this for the last little while, putting it through its paces alongside my wife, including running, cycling, and plenty more. In this review, I'm going to cover the key specs, how it differs from other Garmin Forerunner watches, as well as how the key features work, including accuracy and much more. But I've also got an entire 30 to 40 minute beginner's guide video that walks through this watch like start to finish virtually every single feature out there. That'll drop tomorrow automatically for anyone subscribed to the channel. With that, let's get right into the key specs. The Forerunner 165 is priced at 249 bucks for the base edition or 299 bucks for the music edition. That includes the ability to add offline music onto the watch, including Spotify, Amazon Music, Deezer, your own MP3 files, podcasts, you name it. Both editions have Garmin Pay on it, that's the contactless payment, that allows you to simply tap the watch at any ice cream shop that you want to in the middle of your run and go ahead and pay for that ice cream. Now, as the name implies, the Garmin Forerunner 165, having that one in front of the 65, means it sits below the higher end 265 and below the very highest end Forerunner, which is the 965. What I'm gonna aim to do here is kind of explain these differences as I go along throughout this video, but I'm probably gonna do an entire separate video just focused on comparison. Now, the biggest thing you're gonna notice right away with this watch is this AMOLED display. It's a color touchscreen display. You can swipe down, you can see the different widgets there. Uh, this is the cheapest watch that Garmin has made in the Forerunner series that has an AMOLED display. They first brought that to the 400 265 and 965 a little less than a year ago. And this price point here matches effectively the Garmin Vivo Active 5 that was launched this past fall. But that watch is aimed at more of a mainstream audience, which there's nothing wrong with that, but doesn't have quite the same exact features as this, including notably it lacks the buttons that you see right here. This is right now the Vivo Active 5, and you can see it only has the two buttons on the side. It does have the same touchscreen display, but right away as you go into it, you can see there's some core differences in some of the stats displayed, as well as sort of the UI look and feel. But again, as noted earlier on, the Forerunner series, as the name implies in the very beginning, is designed for runners, get it, for runner. Um, and so you're gonna see a lot of running focused features that you don't necessarily find on the Vivo Acta 5 series. Now, from a battery life standpoint, I've got the battery life chart down below there, but in terms of my real world usage, that four days for always on display has been spot on. I've been doing one to two hours of outside GPS workouts per day, and I'm getting exactly four days of battery life in the always on mode. There are two core modes here for the display. Always on means the display is always on, but dimmed when your wrist is down, versus gesture-based means that it's off when your wrist is down, you raise your wrist up, and it goes into full brightness. So far, battery life is spot on here with everything turned on at basically the fullest settings. Next, from a GPS standpoint, it doesn't have Garmin's multi-band or dual-frequency GPS that you would find on the 400 265, but as you'll see here, I don't think that matters a ton. I dive into that more in the GPS accuracy section. Instead, it's got their all-systems GPS, and it's been working just great for me. So let's just do a quick like nickel tour of the watch. I'm gonna talk about some of the main features that go along. This here is your watch face. It's pretty customizable, both in terms of a bunch of stock watch faces, as well as you can download other watch faces from Connect IQ, and you can customize pretty much all the data on that watch face. Down from there, you've got the widget and the widget glances. Each one of these bits of information here is a widget glance, and then you can crack it open to get more information about that particular widget glance. So here's showing my VO2 max, I can go down and see 5K race predictions, 10K, and so on. Uh, now this is based on my recent runs, and generally speaking, you wanna have a lot of tempo runs and really long runs. I've just had a lot of like interval runs and kind of general runs, which aren't quite as good for you know increasing your VO2 max prediction times here. So these numbers are maybe a little bit lower than normal for me, uh, but if I were to add some more tempo and long runs in, you'd probably see these numbers get a little bit closer to reality. Going on down, you can see recovery time there. Uh, it's at 88 hours, which is really, really high. I would say uh, inaccurately high actually right now. Um, yesterday was at 19 hours after a, a moderate interval run. And then today I did a bunch of testing of power meters and just basically they were all sprint VO2 max efforts. And that really does spike the recovery time quite a bit, but because it was cycling, my legs and my body feel perfectly fine. So I suspect we'll see this number go down and trend down very quickly. Maybe by tomorrow it'll show in the 20 hour range or so uh, based on sleep and other factors. Going down further, you'll see HRV status. HRV status is your heart rate variability status. Uh, and it's basically that's trending uh, essentially fatigue over time. And that fatigue is manifested in these numbers right here. 
Uh, you can go down and you can see my last night's HRV. Uh, you can see my seven day average and you can see my baseline over time. HRV is impacted by many different things, uh, not just general fatigue, but things like heavy workouts, sleep or lack thereof, drinking drugs, both good drugs and how do you want to define bad drugs, as well as countless other factors. Uh, but it's something that you can generally look at and it's a good like leading indicator of whether or not you're getting sick or if you're recovering well and so on. I find it generally pretty useful. Backing out here, you're gonna go down further, you're gonna see a couple different widgets, but most notably, if you go down further, we'll see this sleep widget right there for my sleep score. Uh, generally speaking, I've had pretty good luck with the accuracy of this from a, the time I went to bed and the time I woke up. It pretty much nails that without any problem. The one thing I don't tend to focus on too much is the sleep stages or sleep phases. You can see these right here, the different coloring of deep, REM, light, awake, and so on. A uh, different view of that same thing right there, as well as the sleep stages over the last little while. The reason I don't focus on the accuracy of this particular item too much is that it's just not that accurate across any wearables and the data that you compare this to isn't that accurate either. Um, like from a gold standard standpoint, the accuracy is only in the mid 80 percentile range, which isn't all that hot. We would never use a gold standard heart rate chest strap if it was only 80 percent accurate. So I don't really focus on that too much here. Uh, instead, I just focus on what time did I go to bed? What time did I wake up? And is the kind of total sleep duration time in between there? Correct. Now, in addition to that, if you back out here, there's also nap tracking. I didn't have any naps today, but if you look at this little video I shot yesterday, I took full advantage of that nap opportunity, the nap testing opportunity. I need to, to do the hard work and test this out. Of course, it's not super happy about my nap because I napped for an hour and a half and yeah, you know, I just wanted to push it to its limits. Uh, from there, you'll actually see that manifest into the body battery feature. Uh, body battery is like your energy level over the course of the day. Uh, and you can see the factors that influence that body battery. So your sleep, the nap, your workouts, and so on. And you can see that listed right here. Note that Sleep Coach is not on this watch today. It is something that has come to the uh, Vivo Active 5 and Venue series. The good news is Garmin says that is coming in a future update to this. Doesn't sound like that's super far away, but they didn't pinpoint like an exact date or time as to when that'll happen. Uh, but nonetheless, it is coming down the road. The rest of these widgets that you see here are all totally customizable. You can get rid of ones you don't want. You can add ones that you do like. You can rearrange the order. Uh, you do whatever you want there, you can customize them. Uh, in the event that you did buy the music edition, if we go up here, we'll see the music. Let's see, here we go, music, music, there we go, right there. Music can be downloaded to the watch so you can listen to it later on without your phone or anything else around. Uh, so in the case of this watch, it supports offline Spotify lists as well as offline Amazon music lists and Deezer, and of course, MP3 files and podcasts. Uh, in this case, I've got Spotify loaded on here already, and I've downloaded the Popped Pump playlist. I only download the first 23 tracks of however many tracks that is. And what's cool is because it's a dynamic playlist from Spotify, meaning they're always adding and removing tracks to it, anytime I plug my watch in to power to charge it, it'll go ahead and connect to Wi-Fi, and it'll download the most recent updates to that playlist. Uh, you can also download podcast. You can see the Fit File podcast. That's a podcast that myself and Dez of Dez Fit, another sports tech reviewer, uh, do every week, and we dive into all sorts of sports tech goodness. With that, let's just take a quick look at how a workout or a run works. Uh, so the way it works is you tap this upper right hand button right there, and this gets into the sport listing. These are all sports you can add or customize. I'll put a complete list of all the sports at the bottom of the screen right now. Uh, you can see I go to the ad screen, and I can get even more sports listed down there. Uh, in general, the core difference between this watch and the 400 265 that's more expensive is that this watch lacks multi-sport or triathlon mode. Basically the ability to do multiple sports as part of one cohesive activity. Uh, you can do basically all those same sports here, but you can't have it in one activity like you'd want for a triathlon. Additionally, the 165 does not have uh, power meter sensor support. So if you have a cycling power meter, uh, you can't get that here, but it does have running power meter support natively uh, within the unit itself. And of course you can connect the other sensors to the 165, including heart rate straps and cycling radar and cycling uh, cadence sensors and speed sensors and cycling lights and foot pods. And I think even Tempe, the temperature sensor connects as well. So all the core sensors on both AMP Plus and Bluetooth Smart are supported here. Now going back to the running side of things, if I just back out here again, tap the start button, you'll see the run option right there. At this point, it'll give me my daily suggested workout. This is a workout that it automatically gives me every single day. And it does this in one of two ways. One, if you don't have any training plan or calendar item loaded, or two, if you do have a goal race in mind, you can put that goal race on the Garmin Connect calendar, and it'll actually build out an entire training program for you every single day, including days off, long runs, and you name it. For example, if I tap this upper right hand button right here, you can see more suggestions. And if I go down, you can see here's today, tomorrow, a long run on Saturday, base, rest day, base, 
threshold work and the plan overview and so on. And this is all going towards a marathon I stuck on the calendar in later May, and it's just gonna build that out. This is actually a pretty impressive feature. It's something that Garmin's had for a couple years now. It even accounts for sleep and tiredness, fatigue. So if I have just really poor sleep for a few days, it's gonna kind of come back to me and say, hey, we're gonna scrap today's run and try again tomorrow and automatically adjust the schedule. Also, you can adjust your long run day as well in the settings. Uh, you can say which days you prefer there, uh, multiple days or just one day, uh, in case that can only fit on one day in your calendar. Now I'm gonna cancel out of this for now and go into the options. This is basically where you'd be sitting outside, ready to start your run, waiting for GPS, uh, and connecting any sensors that you have. But if I go and hold this middle left hand button, I can go to the run settings and change data screens. You can have more or less as many data screens as I can seem to add here. Uh, I customized this one yesterday for the beginner's guide and it's kind of wonky because I got basically the heart rate graph on the top and the bottom, but point is you can customize all these. Uh, you can choose a layout here. You can go four page or four data fields down to one. Uh, when I choose what you want, you can then change the data fields within it. And this is a core difference between something like this and the Vivo Active 5 over here, as well as the uh, Garmin Venue series, that this has way more customization of your data fields than the Vivo Active 5 and Venue do. You can see on the Vivo Active 5, I can only choose three different screens right there, whereas I can keep on making screens all day long here over on the 4Runner 165. Now the 4Runner 165 does support wrist-based running power as well as running dynamics, which means that that'll happen automatically whenever you run. You can see that running power or those running dynamics information doesn't require any sort of other accessories. You can also go back here and create alerts if you want to. These can be heart rate alerts, run, walk, pace, time, distance, running power, calories, elevation, proximity, or cadence alerts, as well as configure auto lap, for example, if you want it based on a certain distance, or just simply turn off all together in manual lap. Once you're ready to go here, you go back and you hit this upper right hand button to go ahead and start that run. At that point, you'll see the data pages that you've configured, and you can use the buttons to go up and down those data pages, or you can swipe if you enable touch. All of this worked perfectly fine for me. I had no issues with this from responsiveness and sprints or big shifts and paces. They all reacted or responded very quickly. And likewise, I had no issues with run stability either. Now, once you've finished up with your run, you're gonna get a summary screen with a slew of different stats. Like there is tons and tons of stats. That's honestly what Garmin's known for. They're known for the data. Like that's why you buy a Garmin watch. Uh, and these are all pretty user interface pages. Down at the bottom though, you're gonna see your recovery time as well as your training effect. Those are features that the training effect is unique on the Forerunner series and high end watches versus on the Venue and Vivo Active series. You're going to see it's called training benefit. Uh, slight differences there. In the case of the Forerunner, it's going to be basically a little more specific versus the case of the Vivo Active and Venue, it's going to be a little more general. And the recovery time is until your next hard workout. So just keep that in mind. It's not really to your next workout, but your next hard workout. However, the single biggest difference between the 4Runner 165 and the 4Runner 265 is the lack of training readiness. Training readiness is Garmin's like umbrella bucket, if you will, um, of things over different training load and training status tools. You can see on this right hand side there, training readiness. This is a score that is constantly updating throughout the day. So as you wake up each morning, your training readiness score is higher. And if you go out and do a workout, it's gonna lower down because you're now obviously fatigued from that workout. In today's case, I've had a bunch of workouts, all again, high load workouts. So it's down to nine out of 100. Uh, by the time I sleep tonight, it should be back probably in the 30s or so. But training readiness is including a couple of core factors, most notably training status that you see right there. And that includes your training load or how much work are you doing workout wise in the last little while. That doesn't exist on the 165. The 165 merely has your recovery time right there and then the estimate for your 5K, 10K, et cetera, as well as your VO2 max. Over here, you can see I've got my VO2 max trending, my HRV balance trending, and a cute load. If I go down, my cute load right there is showing optimal. And this is showing what my total training load is over the last little while. And then if I go down further, I can see my kind of buckets of the exercise load in different types and go down again, and I can see the load ratio. In other words, am I trending in the right general direction, either high or low? This is again, all things that exist in the 265 that are not on the 165. Whether or not that matters to you is totally up to you. I'm just kind of giving you like the lay of the land here. The good news though is on both watches, you do get the race calendar and daily suggested workouts. I showed you the daily suggested workouts earlier and kind of mentioned the event uh, and race event race calendar. If I go down to the bottom here, eventually you can see I put a marathon on the calendar right there. And then the race calendar shows up there. And this will actually count down to the exact time there. I can see the current estimate it has uh, for this race based on my uh, workouts as of late, uh, the goal pace I put in there. And if I go down again, 
again, you can see the average temperature for that particular starting time, uh, and it pulls us from a database, so it's kind of cool, both the starting time as well as the average temperature. And then as you get closer, it'll actually show you the real exact predicted weather for that particular day. Uh, and it just simply counts down from there. And you can put multiple events in here as well, and designate an A event and a B event and so on from a priority standpoint. Now, once you have your workout complete, as I mentioned, you'll see all the summary screens in the watch, but you'll also go ahead and see a bunch of summary screens and way more data than on the watch on Garmin Connect, both on the website as well as the Garmin Connect mobile phone app. Here's a whole bunch of screenshots that you're looking at right now uh, from the mobile phone app. Uh, also, it'll sync that workout over to Strava as well as Training Peaks automatically if you have those configured, as well as any of the platforms, third-party platforms that you have configured to your account. Now, at this point, it's time to take a look at some of the data from an accuracy standpoint. Is the GPS in this, despite not having multi-band like the 400 265 has, is it as accurate enough? And is the heart rate sensor accurate, despite not being Garmin's latest generation optical heart rate sensor? That's because this unit here has Garmin Gen 4 optical heart rate sensor as opposed to their Gen 5 seeing on some of their higher end newer units. For all that, we're going to jump over to the computer where I have tons of graphs. And of course, at the end, I've got a complete wrap up overall. Okay, starting off looking at a run, this is out in some farm fields, but there is some tree cover here and there towards the beginning, as well as some tunnels and bridges. Uh, overall, pretty solid right here. No problems with any of these churns. They're spot on, both the Apple Watch Series 9, as well as the Garmin 400 965, basically showing the exact same thing. The only tiny difference I see is going under this kind of overpass uh, tunnel thing, uh, and basically you see a little bit of difference from the 400 965, but the Apple Watch is also different too, just in a different direction. So overall, call not a bit of a wash. Now for the heart rate, side of this, this was a bunch of one minute really hard intervals. And you can see it kind of gets most of them right, but there's a few of them that it struggles. It also struggled at the beginning there on this little bit colder day uh, as normal for optical heart rates. So kind of so-so overall there. Next, it was into the city for some really tough GPS testing here. Uh, you can see this is kind of the overall route. And at a high level, things look pretty good. This is compared against all multi-band units. So basically up against the toughest stuff out there. On the upper sections, you can see there's differences between the two sets. Uh, that's actually accounted for by the left side versus the right side of my body which is why I change directions of the road or other sides of the road halfway through, and they basically kind of even out there. Overall, though, pretty darn impressive results from all these units, especially so given from the 4165, since it has a lesser GPS chipset compared to all the other units I was using there. Looking at the heart rate on that, while they disagreed at the beginning, the intervals actually for the rest of the run were just fine, so pretty good there. Off into doing some mountain biking now in the trees I did. Here's the high level, no problems there. Looking at some of the closer switchbacks back and forth, they're very, very close to all multi-band units. Again, almost no differences except this one section right here where it's just like three to five meters off. We're talking almost nothing. Uh, and again, very minor differences. Meanwhile, on the heart rate for that, well, it struggled until it got warmed up. After that, it did incredibly impressive for mountain biking, which is very, very difficult from an optical heart rate standpoint. And then at the end, you see when I stopped to do some filming, it didn't quite catch back up again. But once it warmed up, it was fine for the rest of the ride. Overall, very solid performance on both optical heart rate as well as GPS. Overall, this is a great little watch. I don't have any real complaints about it. Uh, it takes the most popular features from the 400 265 and brings them down to this. The only feature that's really missing, of course, is the trending readiness. And I suspect like a few years from now, we'll see that down at this price point. But for now, Garmin chooses to keep that at the kind of the premium end of thing. And if you were to go and compare it to something in the same price range, the Vivo Active 5, the single biggest benefit of the 165 is honestly the buttons on the, on the side. That's the thing that I find the most useful. I just love buttons like from a workout standpoint. I just want more buttons to do more things. It's honestly as simple as that. My only real complaint here, if any, is just one more model. Like it's Garmin has so many models that are plus or minus 50 bucks off of 300 bucks that it is insane. I think I counted seven or eight different models uh, and that's excluding like different sizes. And this is just uh, yet another model to add more confusion. I don't have any problems with the pricing on it or the unit itself, the features, like all that works great. It's just, just a lot of things on the table to figure out. But that's probably a different video for a different day. Speaking of which, if you want that full comparison between the Garmin 400 165 and the 265, I'm going to do an entire deep dive video on that here soon. Thus, if you hit that subscribe button at the bottom, then you'll get that the moment it hits your YouTube inbox. Otherwise, go ahead and give it a like. It really does help with the video and the channel quite a bit. Have a good one.